Shall we close our eyes as we start? Our dear Father in heaven, we thank thee for the privilege that we have to be together as workers, men in the field. Please be with us tonight, this afternoon, as we study this very important topic. Help us to understand and to grow and to have uh, the right attitude as we approach our brethren and sisters who are deceived. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, want to start by saying one of the first things I encountered was this problem with the son. He is God's son, and they have this uh, literal, or I would say literalistic view of looking at the son. And he would say to me repetitively, he's God's son. He comes from God. They've got, uh, I would say, a human view of this concept. They, well, I would say a traditional view, not a biblical view. And then, naturally, from that flows the, the problem of only begotten and what that means. And then lastly, the firstborn. How do we see the firstborn? What does that mean in Scripture? Okay, so I'm going to start with the Son, but we're going to finish with the Son as well. And you'll see why. Now this concept of Son is difficult uh, to explain if people have a literalistic view of Scripture. Now, you ask me, what is a literalistic view of Scripture? When you look at Scripture, and you read the literal words, that's the literal words. That's not a problem. That's, you have to take that serious. But if you take the literal words as it is written, and you interpret that in a way that makes sense for you in your culture and your background, with your framework, then it becomes literalistic. That's a simple way of uh, explaining that. Then, Israel is referred to as the sons of God. You are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave your forehead for the sake of the dead. Jeremiah 31, 20. All of you are sons of the Most High. Psalms 82, verse 6. Then I said, how I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of the nations. And I said, you shall call me my father and not turn away from following me. Jeremiah 3, 19. Now, in Deuteronomy 32, 5, we read, they have acted corrupt corruptly toward him. They are not his children because of their defect, but are perverse and crooked, a crooked generation. I think the A fell out of there. And then Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Romans 8, 14. So we can see God speaks, he speaks about his sons they are not literal sons. They are his sons and his daughters because they are following him. They are his nation. He chose them. God speaks also collectively or corporately of his son in the singular. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a delightful child? Indeed, as often as I have spoken against him, I certainly still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 20. So here we see that God speaks collectively as well about his son. 
the king of Israel collectively or corporately stands for Israel. That's why he's called God's son, singular. We read in 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 14, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. Now we know that this, this is a God speaking to David about his son Solomon directly, but we also know that he is speaking about the future son that will lead his nation. So this is messianic as well. And David himself is also called the son of God in Psalms 2 verse 7. And as you will see later on, that's very important that we know that. Psalms 2 was a crowning psalm. Uh, who of you are familiar with the rites surrounding the crowning psalm? Very important right that the kings had. And it seems to me, I'm not sure about that, but it seems to me that we had rights like that with the kings surrounding uh, Israel. When a king became king, he was not immediately king. He had a co-regency with his father. Many, many times he had a co-regency. And during that time, he was king, but he was not really king. And the day he was crowned, he was born as the king. That's part of the whole rite, and that will clear up some problems later. Now, we read in John 1, 45 to 49, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, you know the story. Jesus meets Nathanael, and uh, he tells him that he saw him under the tree. And he's flabbergasted, and he says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So for him, Jesus is the Messiah. And he realizes, realizes as all Jews did, that if they would meet the Messiah, if the Messiah would come, he would be the new son of God, the collective leader of God's people. That's what the meaning of son is. It's not this literalistic view of me, I'm the progenitor and I have a son. That's not the prim primary reason and meaning of this word. And he he couples it with the word king, and he says, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. You are the leader of Israel. That's why I call you the son of God. It's important to understand this. Nathaniel knew what he meant when he used the titles. These are titles that was given to the leaders of Israel. Now, <clears throat> we see the son of God, the leader, the king of Israel. He's got the sons of God that he leads. They are chosen by God. They are led by his spirit. It's not a physical thing. It is real, but not necessarily physical. Then, the king is anointed by God to lead his people. That makes him the king. He is the son of God because he's the leader, but the day he's anointed, he becomes the king. I think you can see where we're going with this. You see this in Psalms 2 verse 7. Now the anointment uh, is, was normally done by a prophet, but then the, there was also the public uh, crowning of the king, as you know. Now Jesus is anointed by God the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of God, but he becomes the King of God's people when he's anointed. He's the King of kings. That's why God says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. 
Um, so th this is important. This term, Son of God, is based in the history. It's based in the concept of the Old Testament. Um, it doesn't carry this literalistic uh, view that the uh, anti-Trinitarians have. Now, if we look at John 1 verse 1 to 2, there are a few very important things we need to know. First, the word aim, in the beginning was, or aim, the word. And the word was, aim, with God. And the word was, aim, God. He was, again, aim, in the beginning with God. It is another form of the word, aimi. And it means to exist, to be present. And uh, Kanali also says we, we need to reinterpret the way we see Exodus 3, 14 and 15. Classically, we saw that based on Greek philosophy as describing God's being. But Ellen White didn't use that. She always used Exodus 3, 14 and 15 to describe God as the ever-present God. He's always there. And that's more correct. And he, he proved that in his dissertation. That's very difficult to work through that thing, but it's a wonderful uh, exercise. So, here we know that this has to do with existence. It doesn't have a beginning or an end in this context. He is, Colossians 1.17, before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Same word, just another form of it, ST. So here we see that he really is everlasting. Just in this few verses, we can see that. Now, I have encountered arguments trying to uh, reinterpret John 1 verse 1, and I haven't found one that I could agree with. It's all following the same format as the original arguments that we always had to contend with when we were working with the Jehovah's Witness. Exactly the same arguments. Um, you also have to know that when the word uh, in arche or in the beginning, it doesn't have a, uh, an article, then it it, it's not a beginning like we know a beginning with a point where it begins and it goes on. It is actually saying any beginning that you can think of before that. Now you can think of a beginning before that beginning. Well, I mean actually before that. And so at finitum. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the idea. So it's a beginning without a beginning. If it's put in this way. Right, then he existed in, already in the beginning. He always existed with God and always was, is, and always will be God. Any beginning you can think of, he was already there with God. He existed before all things. He is, in other words, self-existent. That's what we can see from these two verses. Now, Abraham and all things had a beginning. He did not. If you go through uh, the book of John, the, uh, the gospel of John, you will see that these two groups are, well, these two are contrasted. Jesus Christ, he never had a beginning. He exists. And then the others had a beginning. The Jews said to him, but you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, 
before Abraham was born, Genesis 5, I am, ego, a me. Now he could have done, John could have done this in a more proper Greek grammar, but he didn't. I believe it was on purpose to refer back to Genesis, uh, to Exodus 3, 14 and 15. He is the I am. And we can see in their reaction, that's exactly how they understood him, because they picked up stones, they wanted to stone him for blasphemy. You, you could do that if you believed that was blasphemy. So they wanted to stone him because they believed he was blaspheming by telling them that he is God. Now the word that, they, that is used for Abraham is from the, uh, the stem ginomai, uh, to become into existence, to begin or to receive being. So he's contrasting himself with Abraham. He says, Abraham had a beginning. I didn't have a beginning. Can you see how clear that is? It's, it's really very clear. And this you see right through the book of John, the Gospel of John. Now there's another interesting verse, <clears throat> John 17, 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had, a I. That also comes from the A, B verb, which indicates that that was that e eternal existence with the Father he had. Then he says, with or para. Now we're going to look at para, the preposition, a little bit later. He doesn't say in him. He says para, with. It indicates a separate personality. They are one, but they are two separate persons. And he says before the world was. So besides God, he had the same glory as the God. Now, in Isaiah 42, 8, we read, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. That is a theme that you see right through the Old Testament. God, the only God, will not share his glory with anyone. Because to share his glory is to share his character and his name. And he cannot share that with anyone who wasn't or who isn't God. And he shared his glory with Jesus before he came to this earth. So Jesus, this is underscoring the fact that Jesus was God forever with God the Father before he came to earth. God shares his glory with no one, yet he shared it forever with Christ before the world was. Now, if we read Philippians 2, we don't have time to do everything. Unfortunately, I have to take just the most important. But Philippians 2 tells us that he gave up, and we see that in the spirit of prophecy as well. He gave up his glory. He gave up his godly privileges. But his humanity, he was, his, his, his divinity, sorry, was, was clothed in his humanity. He was still fully God, even though he gave it up. That's why Christ says, I have the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to take it up. All things came into being. Any, again, he taught the same word that's used for Abraham. Through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. John 1.3. I had a discussion, and I can't remember with which group it was. I think it was in Wittbank, but I'm not sure. So I can't quote anyone here, but I had a discussion with someone about this problem. I said to them, well, you say he was created. No, he wasn't created. I said, but you say he came into existence. Yes. How? By God. He came out of God, he says. I said, well, okay, so you say he had a beginning. Yes. I said, well, here it's very clear that nothing had a beginning 
without him. So, if nothing had a beginning without him, how can he have had a beginning? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make scriptural sense, and it doesn't make grammatical sense. Right. Just like Ab Abraham had a beginning, everything else began to exist. The sun did not. Now, Hebrews 13 verse 8. I did an exegesis on Hebrews 13 verse 8, which took me about two weeks. You will not believe it, but that verse is so loaded, and we don't have time to go into all the detail. But it says, you know, you know the, the, uh, the verse very well, Jesus Christ is. Now again, the word aim is used here. In other words, he exists. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if that is true, then Jesus yesterday had no beginning, today had no beginning, and forever will have no beginning. The eternal God it, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So both, uh, 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 all, of, all, all three persons of the Godhead is eternal. Is involved in the action required to make assurance to the human agent. This morning we saw that the, 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 God, the fact that Jesus Christ is God is an assurance of our salvation. You remember that? Now, I'm going to try and prove to you when we do the Holy Spirit that the fact that the Holy Spirit is God is also a proof and an and assurance of our salvation. Same way. Then she says, divinity. You've seen this one already. The eternal Son of God, just as mighty, just as infinitely gifted with all the resources of power. That is almighty. And he was found in fashion as a man. So he was mighty, almighty God, but he was found in fashion as a man. In speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there never was a time when he was not. Now, when I had this uh, discussion... That was the Kruger's Dorp group. The one guy said to me, yes. And he's actually quoting Holquist. He says, yes. There was never a time when he, this is Jesus, was not in communion with the Father. But there was a time where the Father was not in communion with him. <laughs> but just look at the, at the syntax. Yeah, I mean, you are doing grammatical gymnastics in order to, to make this text say what you want. You cannot. Just think about it. Because it is here about the time. And there never was a time where there was not the communion of the two. That's what it says. But in any case, it is very clear. Ellen White did not believe that Jesus had a beginning. When she says eternal, she means eternal because she uses it for the Godhead, all three persons. Why would she mean it for God the Father and not God the Son? It just doesn't make sense. When she says eternal, she means eternal. She applies it to all three persons of the Godhead, as you saw, if the Son is not eternal, then the Father is also not. But they are. And that argument doesn't hold water. You will, you will run into these arguments when you get to work with these people. Now, now we're going to come to uh, Proverbs 8. Davidson, uh, what is his first name? Say again. Richard, would you say Richard? Davidson, our great scholar at Andrews. I can't remember his first name. Okay. He wrote an article, and 
excellent article on Proverbs 8. Whom of you read that? No one. You did. So you know what I'm talking about. Excellent. Not easy to understand, but very well written and very well researched. I do not always agree with them. Uh, I, if, uh, originally I did, but as I went on I realized the spirit of prophecy doesn't agree with him. Always. But it's a good article. Now, if you read through it, it says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. Now that word can be translated differently. Sometimes uh, it's translated as created. Or, you know, there's different ways that it's translated. But this is a very good translation. Possessed me at the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, from everlasting I was established. From the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth, where, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. This is very strong for them. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. Now, from here we don't have a problem. It's just that first part. Okay? Verse 30, then I was beside him. I was the master craftsman. Besides him. So besides God, he was the master craftsman or the creator. Oh, and he, he delighted in mankind. He's, he says his delight is with mankind, which is a wonderful uh, theme. Now, I'm just going to concentrate on the nitty gritty. Possessed can mean created. The Hebrew word, now I made it easy. I didn't put any marks and stops or anything, just that anyone can read it. Kanani. It means prepared. That's what it means. Now, there's a lot of discussion about that, but what I'm trying to say is you can't build a whole theology on a word on which there's so much discussion about the meaning of this word. The second word, established, can mean formed. But the third meaning, according to David, isn't it David? Richard Davidson, okay, okay. According to Davidson, and I agree with him, the third uh, meaning of the word must be used. The word is nasak, and it means appointed, and you'll see just now why. The word brought forth, how lati or how latleti, can mean born, but it actually carries the meaning of born as, born as. As. So again, Alex X. Alex X is a bit of a problem there because um, of the general generalization when they got to the translations. It's very difficult to, to translate these Hebrew words. I had a look at it, but uh, rather look at the, the original Hebrew. Okay, <laughs> but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion. I told you Psalms 2 is a crowning psalm for David. My holy mountain, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So how Leleti can be read as today you are born as a king. Today that you, the, this day that you are uh, either anointed or crowned, you are born as a king. That was how they spoke about kings. And you know that we also use that kind of uh, language today. Um, when he crowns him, he installs him as his king. And that is the Nasak meaning. Now, you have to look at scripture to explain scripture. That is Old Testament usage of the same words, and it doesn't carry the meaning what they want to impose on, on uh, Proverbs 8. So Proverbs 8 cannot be used, because of this argument, cannot be used to argue for a beginning of Jesus Christ. 
there are a few problems. The first one is that you have to be very sure that uh, wisdom is used to portray Christ. Now, Ellen White uses uh, Proverbs 8 to refer to Christ, but she says that it is a personification. That's what she says. So, to use this, I, w I want to say, obscure passage. In the light of all the clear passages that we have that shows us, that show us, sorry, that Jesus Christ did not have a beginning, I think it is not very good or ethical to use this passage to do that. Okay. Then, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Monogine. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. By the way, my, I've cut this study short, so I won't keep you too long. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. Monogenus. That's just another form of the word. John 3, 16 and 18. Now, the word monos means only or unique. And the word, uh, the, the, the second part is from a word genos, which means kind. He's unique in his kind. There's no one like him. That is the, the meaning of this word. He's unique in his kind. Now, sometimes it is used of only begotten sons or first born sons. Uh, he's my only son, Monogenes. What it actually means, he was born, there would never be one like him. Not first born, but only born. There would no, never be one like that. We have the same with Jairus' daughter. They only had this one daughter. Only one. I don't have another one. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten. Monogenus from the Father. Full of grace and truth. So it it shows us that Jesus Christ was unique. We already, already saw that he was the son of God because of the, the fact that he was the leader of God's people on earth. He took that role. And more than that, Jesus became everything. We read in 2 Corinthians, I can't remember the exact verse, that he is the yes on all God's promises. Jesus became everything. He, he took the place of Israel. Also, if you look at the New Testament, it says, I called my son out of Egypt. That was, as you know, originally Israel, the nation. They were the sons of God. But this son of God took the place of Israel. That's why none of the feasts and none of... Uh, uh, the sacrifices, the sacrificial fish system, could continue after him. He completed it, and it was fulfilled in him. That's why it doesn't matter where you, whether you are a Jew or a or a, a Greek or whatever. Yes. Oh, that's... Yes. It's not Ginomai. All right. I'll show you. Can I show you afterwards? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, I can't remember it offhand now, but I will give it to you. I know. All right. Okay. I'll show you. Thank you. All right. So now, uh, where are we now? Oh, what did I say? I got lost now. No. All right. He took, he took the place of Israel. So he became everything. Jesus. Uh, that's also a very strong argument against the feasts because he's everything. Everything ended in him. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Okay. Now, now the birth or the genesis of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be child with the Holy Spirit. Genesis. We have the word Genesis coming from that. The birth or the beginning. It's totally another word as the one that we just spoke about. It means the source or origin. The book of one's lineage in which his ancestry or progeny are enumerated. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn. Now this word is prototokos of all creation. I'm going to read this passage and then I'm going to ask you what you think prototokos means. For by him, now he gives the reason. He says he is the prototokos. Now he says why. For by him all things were created. Both heavens and and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Now you tell me, what's the meaning of prototokos? From that passage. It's clear. He's the most important. That's the meaning of prototokos. He's the most important. And you can see that Jacob passed the title of prominence and its prerogatives on to Joseph, because Joseph became the most important. First Chronicles 5, verse 1 to 2. You can see this right through scripture. Prototokos means the most important. And it's very clear if you read through the passage, because uh, for by him all things were created. Whether on earth, heaven, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He's very important. He is before all things, so he's the first. And in him all things hold together. It's very important. He's also the head of the body, the church. Very important, first foremost. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Because of his resurrection, we all can get life eternal. So that he himself will come to have First place in everything. That says it all. First place in everything. He is the Prototokos. Now, going forth from the Father. What did Jesus mean? I want to tell you, it's not about the verb. It's about the preposition. I made a mistake. We all make mistakes. So I had a, a, a meeting with one of uh, the members and we got stuck on the verb saying he came out ex here from, from God. And I was struggling, and I just realized after uh, 
about thus, 11 o'clock that night, that I'm not going to win this one. And I said, I'll come back to you. When I came back, I realized it's not about the verb, it's about the preposition. Let me show you. The sun. All right. Let's see. He says, uh, sorry. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I came forth. Exalthon. Para to patros. Now remember this. The preposition is para. Now just by general knowledge, what do you mean? But what do you think is the meaning of para? Alongside. Okay. Um, this is another one. Another preposition. The word was with God. Proston theon. Now, this is a wonderful expression because it expresses not just with God, but it expresses also the kind of relationship he had, a face-to-face -face relationship with God. I used a children's book to explain Greek. <laughs> and it works perfectly. Pros or para. You close by or face-to-face -face with a lion. Pros ton leonta. Okay? You're face-to-face -face with a lion. That's the meaning of the preposition here. Then, 13.3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Apple theo exalthon. Apple theo exalthon. Right, we have a little picture. Apple to you, uh, to Leontos. He's running away from the lion. Then, Aston Leonta, his breakfast. <laughs> the lion is swallowing him. Then it's ace, it's into the lion. And um, I used this with my congregation and they understood it perfectly. Okay? And uh, then, I, 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 I think he didn't bath that morning, so the lion spit him out again. Ek to Leontos. So we know if it comes out, this is the word that is used in the Greek. Really out of the inner parts. Uh, we have an example of this in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Ek skotos humas. We are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So when the Bible says he came from God, it means from his side, from close by, in their close proximity with God, face-to-face -face relationship with him. That's where he was, and that's from there that he comes. All three, the sun idea, does not hold water. The only begotten, the use of only begotten, textually and also, if you look at the overall picture, does not make sense. And then, naturally, from God, doesn't make sense. Thank you. That is for today. The next uh, study I'm going to do is on the Holy Spirit. That's going to be a big one. A biggie. And uh, it's more difficult to do that one. I always start with Jesus Christ. Because if you've won the battle with Jesus Christ, you've won the battle. Then to win the battle with the Holy Spirit is not that difficult. But if you start with the Holy Spirit, you're in trouble. I've seen that for myself. Can we just bow our heads? Afterwards we can ask questions. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you very much that we could have spent this time together. Help us to be good, uh, good 
pastors. Help us to be good explainers of your word. And help us to love the people that differ from us. So that we can reach them and bring them back to your church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.